uh, he has to be recognized by the presiding officer and must identify himself for the record. Uh, and so, um, uh, Member Murray, what I suggest is if, if, if you want to participate that you ask to be recognized and then prior to speaking, uh, just make sure you announce your name so it's clearly recorded uh, on the video and for the minutes. Right. Can you hear that, Jim? I did hear that. Thank you. Yep. Member Murray, are you here and present? Uh, I am present. Thank you. And just for your information, Member Murray, Member Miller just walked into the room as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, during each meeting, we allocate 15 minutes uh, at most for non-agenda items, public comment time, so to speak. Is there anyone present who would like to take advantage of the 15 minute block? Seeing none, uh, we'll go on to a consideration of the September 18, 2018 regular meeting minutes. Any changes or modifications? I did receive some modifications um, from member um, Russell that um, again, appear to be minor typographical in nature. Any substantive modifications? Hearing none, could we have a motion, please? Motion to approve, given the changes for typographical reasons. Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Oh, sorry. All right. <laughs> uh, Member yeah. Murray. <laughs> <laughs> Agenda item number four, but before we get to that, I, I think we'll uh, swear in Mr. Solsky. Um, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. All right. Agenda item number four, public hearing for 355 West Washington, uh, Blair Park. Cole, oh, if you want to give us an overview, please. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Um, so this is, a again, a relatively... Um, straightforward request to follow along with hopefully. Um, so previously the park district has come to this um, body and as, as you're aware, um, the golf course, the Blair Park Community Center, that Blair Park itself, that whole complex um, is governed by a series of special use permits and amendments thereto um, concerning the operation of various um, parts or aspects of the facility. Uh, as that site is developed, so too have these amendments developed. So here, um, a few years back, specifically in 2008, um, the park district redeveloped one of its tennis courts into a series of, of paddle courts um, for use as part of the sport of paddle tennis in the winter. Um, so at that time, as it, as it says on the memo, there's um, some operating hours that were, I believe, it, part of the ordinance negotiated through um, you know, public comment and through testimony received by this body um, designed to protect and, and mitigate harmful impacts to some neighbors immediately east of, of the paddle courts. So ordinarily, Sunday through Thursday, when there's no league play, they'd have to stop operations, turn off the lights at 9.30. When there is league play through a, a Chicagoland um, paddle conference, I suppose, um, that operation can go until 10.15. On Fridays and Saturdays, whether or not there's league play, that operation could go till 10.30. Again, at, at whatever time that is, operations need to stop. Um, game can't be played anymore, lights have to go off. Um, what the park district is proposing um, after a bit of consultation with, with those neighbors is um, each year to pick one day per week um, and then from October 1st to March 31st for that one day go 15 minutes longer um, just as a, a change necessary to accommodate some league scheduling in those courts try to make sure they don't have games that are overrunning so far that they can't successfully be played and before the lights have to go off before the court has to shut down. Now, um, a, a little bit of late news on the dais, and perhaps we can take a minute um, to review these. You do have two email chains um, between representatives of the Park District and the Gamreth family, which is one of the adjoining property owners. Um, these were provided to me today, and just want to make sure you had a chance to see them and review those issues. Again, we've received no written public comment directed at us. This is between representatives of the Park District and um, the neighboring properties. I wanted, wanted you to have a chance to see that. All right, Mr. Solsky, if you could state your name and title for the record, that'd be great. 
Uh, sure. My name is Ron Salsky. I'm the executive director for the Lake Bluff Park District, and I'm here on behalf of our seven ele elected officials. And so thank you for hearing our, our, um, our application. So uh, I thought Glenn did a good job of breaking out the history. So I was here. I started actually tax day of 2008, right in the heat of this conversation of the paddle tennis and working with the neighbors and uh, I, I will say that uh, it was a, a great opportunity for me to get to, to know the neighbors right away and to really work with them and understand their concerns about the paddle tennis in general noise things like that and we did a really good job I think working with them and making some adjustments and landscaping and things like that and so uh, with that ordinance that was approved uh, the the future of a fourth court was added uh, that we had that ability to, uh, to, to construct it. At the time, we didn't have any funds to do that, so uh, that, that occurred in 2017. So nine years later, the fourth court was built in 2017, and uh, due to the paddle members raising a significant amount of money. And no doubt about it, I'm sure, uh, I think you've seen in uh, Ms. Gamrath's information, I'm sure it's created more noise, adding a fourth court. I, I could understand that, and, and she's been a great neighbor, and I, I believe her. I'm sure it has. Um, and so with every play, every policy, every ordinance, um, we always feel that, at least I know at the Park District, an opportunity to review uh, and possibly modify based on the usage, the programming, uh, the number of people involved. And so we are in a situation where the program's been successful and it's grow and continues to grow. And a key league, and it's really the Wednesday night league, is our series, our top series. And the top series seems to have the longest rallies. Uh, they're better, they just uh, it continues and the points continue on and on and on. And that's kind of the goal of paddle tennis is let your opponent make the mistake so everyone's just playing on and on. And so um, what's happening is the lights shut off at 10.15, we meet the ordinance, uh, and then their match is cut short and they're trying to figure out you have people traveling from Hinsdale, a lot of different places, and then the the, the match is cut short and, and the league, the Chicagoland League is trying to figure out how do we do this, do they play it over. So we're also, we're concerned with revenue, potential sanctions on us as well as potential revenue loss by not having these leagues, uh, this one series. And so uh, when, when the paddle players approached us, um, we said, well, why don't we go for four or five days? And that's when we sent out letters to the neighbors and Ms. Gamrath and uh, Mr. Cruz, uh, who I see around walking. And they were very concerned and from the noise and everything else. And so uh, we talked to the board, we really listened to them and we said, the paddle players as well as their staff said, we think we can, Wednesday night is the only night. We feel that's the biggest problem for us is the Wednesday night in that one specific league. league. And so um, I don't wanna speak for Ms. Gamrath and uh, any information is there. What we did tell her is I will do what it takes to look at landscaping. We did look at shields. Our concern with the shields is definitely will change the play potential spots darker spots in certain areas that does cause what we believe is a safety hazard the players are concerned about that you can't see going into a corner in the fence uh, you can't see the ball up high there's a variety of uh, concerns with that so uh, what we're hoping to do is compromise uh, with the, the concerned neighbors and they've really been great for the last nine years I think we've been good neighbors they've been great neighbors and uh, that if we can do this one night, I can't guarantee, and I hope not, I'm not here every, every year after this saying, can we do Monday night? Can we do Tuesday night? Where does it end? And I think that's some of the neighbor's concern. Where, where does this end? Um, I, I don't wanna be coming back here every year on this. It's been nine years since the last time we came here. So hopefully it'd be another nine years or sometime after that, I'm not too sure. I can't guarantee it, but I think we have a good solution for this one league. We've been doing fine in all the other leagues and meeting the times and finishing on time. So, uh, so what we're, we're asking tonight is 
for the one night to go to, to 1030 and uh, I will be glad to take any questions from there. We'll continue to look at landscaping and, and uh, if we had to find better shades, things like that, we are willing, more than willing to pay for things like that and express that to them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Solsky. Um, let the record really reflect that the uh, standards for variation and, and uh, standards for special use permits are incorporated into the record so you don't have to go through that. I think the commissioners will ask you specific questions if they feel so fit. Um, commissioners, uh, who would like to start? Uh, I just have a, a question first. When speaking with the neighbors, was it more the light or the noise that was of more concern? Um, I think it is, it's, it's probably both. I'm going to say the, the light, we changed out the lights and we received a variation on, on I believe the lights, I was at a few years ago. Uh, so we did, there's, there's definitely more of a glow uh, off the courts. So that is a concern with the fourth court. Just adding the fourth court just doesn't help in general. Uh, I think the, the, the most of it is the noise, I will say, because you know, kids are sleeping at that time. So I, I give you an honest answer with that, that you know, that extra 15 minutes of hearing uh, a couple courts and sound and the pavement, the ball hitting the, the metal, I'm going to say I think it's predominantly uh, the noise at that point. Yeah, I, I would think so as well, because there's, there's a fair amount of uh, material in here about lighting, you know, changes with the recessed fixtures and whatnot. What types of things have you done to look into noise reduction uh, possibilities, whether it be permanent or perhaps temporary? Is there something that could be erected? Um, I'm not in the sound area of sound reduction, but uh, something that could be done to, to mitigate that um, in general. Yeah, to, to be honest, we, we haven't pursued that. I mean, that's something that we would be glad to pursue, and that's usually what we do. There's different ideas, but we, um, uh, we haven't done that. We just haven't done that. We, we, I guess where we assumed, it's not always great to assume, but on Friday nights and Saturday nights going to 1030, that maybe this wouldn't be as big of an issue, but people are going to work during the week, and I think that's part of their concern, and the kids going to school. Uh, so I, I think that's the biggest part. But I, I would be, I, we have not investigated that. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll, I'll let the other commissioners ask questions and, and whatnot and continue to the, the comment, but I think that to me is by far my bigger concern is the noise versus the light. Um, not that the light is a good thing, but it's much easily, much more easily dealt with and mitigated with you know good shades um, that you can do. But the the noise does travel, um, and during the week, I'm, I'm actually I wasn't part of the the board when it was first approved, but I'm surprised it goes till 10 or 10:15 anyway on a weeknight with you know kids going and even you know adults going to work the next day. So. Um, yeah, that, that would be my concern is the noise, not the light. I understand. All right. Thank you, David. I just uh, another question about uh, panel itself. I mean, what time do matches start up? Well, they start at 7 o'clock. What we've talked with the paddle players is start, start at 7. Let's not start getting there at 7, 10, right. 7, you know, all of a sudden the, the TV's on in the hut and see a game on. Uh, so we've been pushing them hard, and they've been doing a much better job understanding the concerns of the residents to start on time right at 7 o'clock. So um, I'd probably say in years past that that's uh, I don't know how consistent we've been, but uh, better this year, much better this year in understanding the, the concerns of the residents. So um, you know, we've been inheriting, in, uh, we've been adhering to the 1015 this year, and uh, they've just been doing the best they can. So most of their matches are going to be starting here, if not pretty just soon. Just walk me through it. So a match starts at seven. And then it's three hours long. Well, no, they have, there's there's different court. levels playing, so you you have four courts, so you have two levels going on at the same time. So, right. and and you have, um, and so you might you might you'll have four mat almost a total of eight matches. So you can have a match lasting two hours. Oh, really? Yeah. Hour and a half, a good hour and a half match. Right. So there's teams. <clears throat> 
rotating in and out. Right. Well, I would agree that it's, it's probably the, the, the noise more than anything else, um, although I, I live not that far from there. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's 15 minutes. I mean, it just, I know if I'm sitting there, I'm a paddle player, and I'm going, oh, well, what's 15 minutes? You know, how can that um, be that detrimental to the, to the neighborhood? But I, if your kid is trying to fall asleep and can't fall asleep, I get that too. So, um, that's all I have. Thank you, Member Badger. Member Russell. Um, Ron, is there room at the east end of the, the paddle facility or the east end of the two tennis courts that separate the paddle facility from the homes back there? Is there room to put in another row of uh, evergreens? Because um, I know that the evergreens that you put in along the, the north side to buffer the neighbors that are further to the north, those are probably 20 feet tall now. And I mean, there's no question that vegetation does absorb sound. It, it, so it, it, I mean, vegetation alone would help with the, with the sound attenuation. Definitely, we haven't heard uh, from any of the neighbors on, on the north side with all that vegetation uh, on sound or things like that. It's definitely more open on where the gamrats are, are at. Um, I would have to work with our landscape architect, Cliff Miller. When we looked at it originally back in 08, the slopes were really difficult over in that area, and it was very tight between the back of the fence and their property line. Uh, that's something we would be glad to investigate again and be able to uh, commit to if we were able to get some more in there. Um, I, we would be glad to do that. We would absolutely be glad, but we'd have to revisit that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, as I understand it right now, the lights do go off. They're on an automatic timer. It's not that someone has to remember at 10, uh, 10 15 or 10 30, depending on the time of the week. So you have a full time clock that, that now is, can be adjusted for when, if we approve the 15 minute extension on Wednesdays, you can, you're simply going to adjust the time we're clock. We're going to have to adjust it. We're going to have to figure that out. What's the bad? I mean, it's, we have, we're going to have to adhere to if this ordinance is approved to 10 30. So either our maintenance team is going to have to turn it off or we're going to have to put in a new system of some sort that says Wednesdays it turns off at this. So um, the neighbors will probably call me on my cell phone if it's not. So uh, we're going to have to get make sure that absolutely happens. So it's a little tricky with the timers because it's a little bit easier Monday through Friday at 1015. I'm sure there's some timers out there that that are programmable, programmable that each day of the week. for each day of the week. Yeah. So Okay, so you're not going to rely on the the uh, players themselves to have the lights no. off at a certain time it would definitely be no park district personnel until you can get a uh, absolute automatic timer yep. that you can program in yes okay. that's all i have thank you member russell member miller how many families are affected by this um this this particular process problem this, uh, there's, let's see, the, the one, two, three, four. I believe there's five right there. Okay, it's on that side, it's on the north side. Yeah, we haven't heard. Mr. Mr. Cruz is, he's more on the north side. His concern is more from the lights because his he has a second level and he can see the fourth court. And when the leaves fall off, that's, he, he's kind of, doesn't have shades, uh, doesn't want shades. So he can see pretty much right so and then the, the noise of people leaving when they turn out of the parking lot the lights head into there but we have a large group of arbovita that that helps with that so I think it's just doors so slamming or you're saying like there's that. five homes with the more of the noise that is correct okay and how many of those five homes have objected to one and the others you haven't heard anything or? we we've talked with them some said you know we're concerned we have little kids we understand we love the park district um, see what you can do okay. and I, I would like to echo the other members about the sound uh, to me it's sound is is very critical when you're trying to sleep if you're a, a light sleeper um, if we can get, if I can get some guarantees or some reassurances that that besides, maybe besides um, greenery, some kind of sound shield, even if it's just a temporary shield that goes up during league play, 
that can just mask some of the sound, it would make it much more palatable even to extend it every night of the week till 1030 if the sound can be mitigated. I'd love to find a long-term solution than just... Yeah, but the long-term solution won't help these people in this... Right, I understand now. that. Um, I, I just can't guarantee that... No, I'm not saying you can't, but can. I think I would make a... Hopefully you'd make a concerted effort... Oh, absolutely. ...to, to, to put this into motion. Uh, there, I, I think, uh, remember, uh, Miller, every time that, uh, especially back in 08, uh, we spent almost... Twenty, thirty thousand dollars additional on landscaping, uh, with some of the uh, added another five thousand dollars in landscaping last year. Every time the neighbors come to us, we try to work. I mean, we've worked really hard with them. They've been great neighbors, and so I, I feel confident that I can stand up here and say and report back that we we would we would talk to as many companies as we needed to to find some solutions. I just. It's going to be just we didn't pursue that coming into here. Okay, well, I would uh, be in favor if we did decide to pass this motion that it be a one year trial and that if, if it becomes too bothersome to the neighbors, we readdress this in a year or next year when, when the new leaks start. I wouldn't give this a blanket approval forever, would be my concern. So yeah, and I, I, I guess I would echo that, and I'm, I'm disappointed because I think we want to work together with you, and I think you want to do the same, and we want to be supportive of each other as groups, but I feel like we're kind of in a tough spot here that it's, you know, whatever, October the 17th, and this is going to potentially impact your ability to do a league, and I think under most cases, we would say, okay, uh, go back and investigate and find out what can be done. What are the possible solutions? What's the budget that you have for this? And I don't at all question your intentions, but there's, you know, there's obviously economics involved as to what you can put in, when you can put it in, what the budget will, will call for. And uh, many times that's what we tell an applicant, be like, okay, go back and, and check out this option, come back, or we'd say conditional upon something, but I don't think we know what that something is yet in, in terms of what's even feasible or doable. And so given that we're heading into the season, is it the kind of thing where you could make a short-term accommodation, like pulling it up to 630 for one of the leagues um, so they could start early and give us time to look at some of these other options? Uh, I think we, I'd feel more comfortable if we knew what that mediate or uh, mitigation strategy was going to be um, not that again not that I don't trust you but I think um, we like to have you know all the facts on the table so to, to answer a couple of those questions uh, maybe they weren't really more questions but points um, uh, the first in terms of the timing we would always rather come in here well in advance and not put up any committee or uh, in, in in a position to make a last minute decision when we I sat down with all the paddle players and it was August uh, basically July August to hear kind of a wrap up what are some concerns where are we at and and we had 30 uh, uh, men in the room walking through all the things what can we what we can do differently and so at that point in time that's when we started going through a process is what's involved with that and so by that time you're already forming teams and so unfortunately the timing was after the season and it was um, it, that's why it is 11th hour normally we don't like to do that and put you in that position so we do apologize for that in terms of 630 that was a, a question with our board unfortunately but people are coming from all over downtown all the leagues most of the leagues all start at seven o'clock so people are coming from Hinsdale so that's um, the league sets the times oh so you have no no, no control no over times time. yeah okay um, hmm. got it that's too bad um, okay uh, Member Murray, if you could state your name for the record, and then if you'd like to comment, please proceed. This is Jim Murray, and uh, you know the the one observation I'd make is that obviously we don't want to put process hurdles in front of 
what you know seems on its face to be a very straightforward request. That being said, with only five residences, <clears throat> and I'm just looking at a map here, um, visibly kind of impacted here, I would think that before you, you move forward, there should be uh, you know a, a, a concerted effort to actually communicate and confirm you know, the, the, the point of view of each of those five. Um, it's not so onerous to have five conversations, particularly when you know, there's this combination of you know, time of night, um, you know, the cold kind of fall and winter you know, kind of evenings where sound travels, uh, where light is you know, off snow and without obstruction. I think it has the potential to be disruptive to you know, a family's evening. So I, I would just make the observation that if, if we're going to go forward, I, I would have liked to see you know, a specific contact made or at least attempted to be made to each of those five parties. But that's my only comment, Mr. Chairman. Oh, that, oh thank you, Jim. Can I, can I just add that we sent emails, we sent letters to them. Um, we usually see them at the fitness center or things like that. I mean, if we have to continue to do that, um, we, we felt that's our kind of our normal course of action. Uh, and so we asked people to respond back to us, and and so uh, those that did um, sat down with us or came to a meeting. So, how many how many of those five came to the meeting? One. And the neighborhood hasn't changed to any great extent over the last several years, has it? Uh, let's see. I, I believe on that side there's uh, two new neighbors. How many uh, paddle members are there in the park district? Uh, we're close to uh, roughly between 150, 160 members. And then how many visitors come in per year? Uh, you get two per team, so you could have up to 16. Per, per night? Per night. Or league night. Or, or league nights. Okay. 10 to 16, depending on how many they're carrying and on their team. And, and the season, I mean, the leagues have started? Yes. So March, so what we are requesting is just through the season. Uh, and originally we had it all year, and then that was some of the conversations when we talked with Ms., uh, Mrs. Gamrath to, to say, where she said, you know, all year. And we said, you know, good point. That wasn't totally our intent because the leagues are really meant for – uh, fall through spring so that we revise that as well so that we can um, l accommodate what they were when our league play is only and have you mr. Solsky committed to Wednesday night because from my perspective if I were a neighbor I'd want to have a commitment that it's X night per week and, and it doesn't vacillate I might. Is it in here on Wednesday nights? In the application, um, it it a <clears throat> it asks that um, each year you pick one night, not that necessarily be a Wednesday night every. Year. Okay, so maybe we're on Wednesday night. So it's it's the one series. So um, I'm thinking that's Wednesday nights, but it is only one night, and we'd be consistent. Okay, because I think that's very important from a neighbor's perspective. Any further discussion? Uh, I'd just like to add that I'm at this point I'm inclined to go with member Miller's suggestion that um, we have a approved this one 15 minute extension on a one this one night a week uh, Wednesday night as stated in the request and that would provide the additional impetus to make sure that the park district does investigate the improvements to the screening and sound because they're not going to get this extension beyond the uh, beyond next March if we do the one the one year or six month trial period through the league the rest of the league season and then ask them to come back with their solutions yeah I do want to clarify I don't know why I'm it's in my mind Wednesday night maybe because it is Wednesday night it's this the same day it remain consistent so it might not be Wednesday it might be the Tuesday but it would be Tuesday every week 
March or October through March. So it's in my mind is Wednesday that they play, but I'd have to double check what day that is. But it would remain that same day each week. Each season. Each season in each each week. Yeah. So it'd be every Monday right. or every Tuesday. Well, I'm inclined to agree with um, Member Miller as well. I, I just trying to think about if 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 adding um, trees or some sort of foliage as a sound barrier is, is maybe somehow the the right idea or going down that path. How are, how is how are they ever going to put that up now uh, and then have some sort of results? by the end of the season, I guess. I agree, but I, at least we'll have um, neighbor input by next season, and if they object, if they don't object, I guess it doesn't really matter. Be my yeah, I'm just looking at these emails, you're right, that's a good point, I mean, these just all sort of came in today, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they were sent to me today, I mean, you'll see the timestamps oh. underneath. Um, I think some of those date back to oh. August. You know, we do have some early October last week, um, and then a previous chain that dates to mid-August. Early October. Yeah. So uh, this is, again, what I've been provided as far as communications between the Park District and, and these individuals directly. Got it. So they each, in addition to whatever the Park District sent out, they each got our, um, you know, our notice to neighbors. Right. We haven't heard anything. Well, it would certainly allow uh, the Park District a year to come up with some solutions. Uh, as well as, as the neighbors to come forward if it really is an issue, so. Um, another question, has, was this the situation last year? I don't remember when the fourth court went in. So is this the same situation as what happened last year? <coughs> in so terms of the, the dealing with the 1015, this is not a new, I mean, I know you guys got feedback over yeah, the summer. Yeah, no, no, it's been, it's been pretty consistent. But you've, so you've had to deal with this for a we've while. We've had to deal this, with this for a while. So these, these matches just have been going on. It, they, they're, they're just quality players, and the points just last. So yes, to answer your question, it's been going on for some time. OK, so I mean, I guess my, I'll just kind of, my point is I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to rush this, to be honest, um, given that it's been going on. It went on all last season. so. To San, uh, Member Badger's point, we're not going to see anything that really would provide any kind of empirical feedback until this time next year. And so, I mean, whatever plantings or whatever would go in, assu assuming it's not artificial, would go in during the summer months, spring and summer months after the winter season is done. Um, of course, there would be some summer effect that you'd have, but you wouldn't have the winter effect when the tree leaves are off the trees, the snow's on the ground, that sort of thing. So I don't think we'd actually be sitting here with any more information than we had right now. And so I would be in favor if uh, whatever options were investigated and at least we knew what we were voting on so that we knew what was going to be put in over the next year. And so we could say, okay, I feel comfortable that that's a good effort to shield the sound. Some of it may happen now. If it's artificial, some of it would happen next summer, but I feel good about the efforts that are gonna be taken. Whereas right now, I think it's, we're gonna be in the same position without any further facts uh, about the impact this time next year. So I, I, I don't, I think it's a better approach, but I think I'd rather delay it one month and give you and, and the resources that you have some time to come up with some options as to here's what we're thinking about doing, here's what we have the budget for. Because um, I, I know that's a realistic consideration, is how are we gonna pay for this stuff? And so here's what we have the budget for, here's when we're gonna do it, here's the impact to sound and lighting, and then we know, we know what's actually gonna go in. Any, uh, any further discussion from any of the commissioners? What, I guess one quick question, Mr. Salsky. Is there uh, a park district representative on duty every evening at 10 or 10.15? We have our maintenance staff. So, somebody is there. So the lights do go off at 10.15 or 10.30, whatever the schedule is. Yep. 
and they, to an, any great extent, do they monitor sound? I mean, in other words, if you got a couple participants that are rather vocal, do they respectfully ask to? Yeah, uh, well, I should clarify. There, it's it's our we have a maintenance staff who's over at the rec center who will sh shift over and clean or stop over. So it's not someone in the hut. Okay. Uh, per se, so. Um, uh, someone does call I'd probably get an email I'd see it on my phone the the residents do have air uh, I, I believe they have Eric our pros uh, number phone number that would say hey this is you know we're hearing this we're doing that we try to have that relationship but I thought they did because he tends to call me and say hey Ron this is what happened this is what's going on so we try to make it as friendly as possible and easy for them to get in touch with us if there's something going on but we really haven't had any issues with lights staying on or things like that where we're getting complaints about that. Okay. It really comes down basically to the noise. Any further discussion? Yeah, just Dave, in response to your thoughts, I'm sitting here thinking a month from now we get, we get some sort of report back from the park district. Um, I think we're still going to be in more or less the same boat because we're, we're, we're still going to be taking a, making a big assumption as to whether or not whatever they're proposing is going to have any effect at all. Um, and we'll, more, so more or less we're going to be taking the same vote. Do we allow this one 15 minute extension on a trial basis um, for this season until March? I, I don't, I don't think anything else is going to change because uh, we're not, we're not, sound experts per se or I, I agree that we're not sound experts and I'm not necessarily saying that we should have um, you know burden the, the park district for hiring a sound consultant or anything but we'll at least know the scope of it we'll have something to go on to say yeah we think that's an appropriate mitigation strategy I think what we're doing now is expecting I mean to me that nothing may may get done we may find that it's just not within the budget and hey, things have to be reviewed. And, and we may be here a year from now and, and say in the position it's 15 minutes and, and maybe nothing was done, not due to lack of intent, but, or, or certain things were done. And I, I, I'd like, I mean, we do this for lots of people where we say, hey, you need to landscape this or landscape that without actually knowing the specifics. So I think having a better sense for what that plan looks like. I just find the verbiage, you know, I always dislike this in a lot of strategic plans and, and all kinds of, not just the park district, but, you know, continues to research. I'm just, it's so fuzzy to me. It's like, that's not really actionable. No, there's nothing that says that something's gonna get done. And so to me, I default to nothing's gonna get done. It got nothing to do with intentions. It's just research is study. It's not do anything. So I would like to know more about what's going to be done to feel comfortable. I know it's not facts. It's Can not I throw out one idea, which uh, I don't know if this is a compromise, something what Member Miller mentioned, and it's this, you know, a season, a trial season is once the season's done at March, you know, one thing that we do is we can reach out to, to the residents on a monthly basis. How's it going? How's this date? You know, how, how's, how's this extra 15 minutes going? And then when it comes time to the end of March, to be able to sit down with them and ask them, how did it go? What was the major impact? And then that gives us an opportunity to come back and say, well, maybe we, we need to get landscaping in sooner than later. We need to do some things. So instead of waiting until October, we're coming back in August. It's right when the season ends, almost, and we could probably we'd probably know a lot more as it gets to to almost uh, first of March to have a general sense of how much was the impact on the neighbors. Would you so, even know by January? No, uh, it's. A, I mean, they'll know within the first couple of months what they're... Yeah, I mean, that, that's something, we, absolutely. I, I mean, I think that's something we can report back. It would be a concern if all of a sudden we went back to the league and said we need to no, change it back. I wouldn't back. say that. What I'm just saying is we're planning for future. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think, a fair thing to be able to come back and at that point in time to say, hey, this is, 
this is the, the true impacts. And if we, I, I understand what you're saying. A lot of people probably come in front, uh, in front of you. But if the things that we do, we go to neighbors' homes. We we at night and we check lighting. If Miss Gamrath said, "Hey, come on, can you hear the noise? Come on by at 10:30, 10:15, 10:20." That's what we do. That's kind of uh, the, the the pride we take. So I, I would be gl be glad to report and do that myself. And and you put that as part of the motion. I'd feel very comfortable with that. Are they allow they allow alcohol. Pardon? Is alcohol allowed? At, at the at the hut? Yes. Uh, certainly, we can uh, we can incorporate conditions into a possible motion to approve. Um, and you know, one of the conditions could be a status report on or before February 1st, and uh, also a finite period, meaning that if, if there was a recommendation to approve, that the approval runs through March 31st of 2019, and that would put the onus on, on the district, obviously, to come back to us. So, and it would also, I think, give the neighbors certainly uh, confidence that, hey, we're as a board, we're monitoring their concerns, and we want to reach a, a fair and reasonable uh, resolution, if possible. So, any further Perfect. discussion? Do we have a motion? I will make the motion to approve this on a one-year trial basis with the stipulation that the Park District comes back to us by January 31st or February 1st with an update report and that any neighbor concerns be addressed immediately in some way. Is there a second? Second. Okay, further discussion? Um, Elliot, I'm concerned about your phrase right at the end. At the end. That they'd be addressed immediately. I thought about I don't that. know what that means. No, if you can we can skip that, that last, we can skip that last sentence because it doesn't have any meaning. Because you're not going to stop. Mr. Chairman, this is, this is Jim stop. Murray. I just, uh, you know, to clarify that last point that I'd like to add to that list of deliverables on the 31st that the Park District report back specifically on conversations held with each of the five affected households um, and like to have some specificity around that. And if it's not possible to contact a particular party or they don't engage, I think that we, we'd like the feedback on the 31st of January to formally reflect that. Okay. So I want to retract my last that last sentence uh, because we're not going to stop this in the midstream, so it's not going to happen. It's, did you, did so the motion is for a finite period, meaning this season, this season essentially only, through March thirty first of twenty nineteen, with a with an update on by by January thirty first, and remember Murray's suggestion. Okay. Sam, you still second? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, could we have a vote, please? Yes, the order is random. Uh, Member Burns? Nay. Member Badger? Aye. Member Murray? Aye. Member Russell? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Chair Peters? Aye. Motion carries. And Mr. Salsky, as, as you're aware, it's a, uh, it's a recommendation to the, to the board. It, it's not a final decision, obviously, but um, we certainly appreciate your time and coming toward us with the uh, with the petition. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Oh, and certainly. Ideas. Um, as you might know, we're in the process of reviewing that real ordinance or draft ordinance, and I think we've got that as number eight on our agenda. Um, but I'd like to consider if the board is willing to have a motion to shift the. Um, topic so that number eight shifts into the number five spot and so we could talk about real if you'd like to uh, while uh, while you're here so could I have a motion so, so moved, moved. Second. Second. voice vote aye. Aye. aye okay motion carries agenda item number five will now be the Rio institutional zoning workshop Certainly, and um, before we start, uh, Mr. Salski, if you would, um, we've heard that there's been some updates regarding the uh, situation at the golf course, which has always been uh, kind of a principal um, 
of, of interest to this institutional zoning discussion? Uh, yes, so Ron Salsky again, Executive Director for Lake Bluff Park District. So, uh, yes, this Rio has been, um, it's been a, a great opportunity to work with the village staff and to, to understand how, how to, uh, I guess, come to these committees and, and outline projects, not at the last minute, but well in advance so that we can work through some issues and, and not feel as though that you have to make a, a last minute decision. And, and I think that's a big part of this. That's what I, I, we like about this, because sometimes it's been an awkward process where we go through all the planning and then all of a sudden we come here and then it feels like, what do we, do we really have a say or not? So I, I think it gives us a good opportunity to work with the public and all the committees so that we, uh, we can have a better planning process and a more fluid and efficient process. So, so we're really excited about this. And how this really also came into play is the whole golf course. So the golf course, I, I believe we sent a letter over to the village uh, uh, requesting you know, kind of a rezoning because it's zoned residential right now and more for open space. So when we were working on this with the village staff. We thought this was a perfect opportunity for us to uh, request that we would really like that all our parkland rezoned to this if it gets approved. So let me go into the golf course really quickly. Um, so we, the board is really excited and happy to announce that we approved, uh, the board approved a five-year license agreement with Golf Visions Management, Inc. And um, basically what that means, a license agreement is the, they pay us essentially a dollar um, set amount, that's what the agreement is. Uh, they take on the golf cart lease debt. Uh, we take on the continued uh, uh, bonds, outstanding bonds on the land uh, that we took out years ago. But they take on all financial risk and all exposure. Uh, so basically all revenues and expenses come off our, our, our books. We've been losing significant money over the last 10 years operationally. So what that does is uh, allow us with some, some restructuring and reorganization of our team is um, uh, find roughly about $2.1 million over the next five years. Um, and it keeps a golf course in town and uh, the cap, a couple more details. The, the capital is um, any capital on the land or the building or things like that is our expense, uh, anything over $10,000. The maintenance equipment is still in the possession or owned by the park district. Uh, so if uh, we're hoping, knock on wood, for the next five years, that equipment could could be okay and that we don't have to invest a whole lot of money into the equipment. The company thinks they've had a chance to review it and our mechanic does a really great job. So uh, it, it is a win-win. It, it puts us on a better path than where we were before and it does keep uh, golf in town. It would have been a massive undertaking for this committee, I will tell you, uh, if we were doing some land planning of some sort. Uh, and um, so that's where uh, Rio really would have come into play, especially with all of that land. And so there may be some things down the road with the golf club, but it is exciting news for the town. I mean, the, the, the residents, some of the residents did a great job fundraising, almost $118,000 to date. Uh, they didn't reach their goal, but that's okay. They had six months to do it, and and uh, that will contribute. Hopefully, uh, the board will be discussing that, what that will be used for, uh, and they'll be discussing that in another couple weeks. But we feel really, we feel really good uh, about this arrangement. It's this uh, Golf Visions uh, has about 21 courses in the the Chicagoland area, it's family owned. They're out of Mundelein. Uh, uh, they've known golf for a long, long time here. So they feel that, um, that th there is some opportunity to generate some revenue. It's a little bit different than us because we have a lot of indirect expense going into it, pension costs, 
uh, unemployment, all those other things. So now that is on that that exposure and that risk is purely on this management um, group. There is a revenue share model as well. So anything over eight hundred thousand dollars, food and beverage lessons, things like that, we do get a portion as well. So. Um, I'd be glad to answer questions about the golf course in general, but I think it is important that we talk about it because it could have been a really extensive topic on this committee uh, if if we didn't have the golf course. But it was part of the whole Rio um, discussion, definitely. Well, I think uh, congratulations to you and the board. Uh, I think that's a tremendous uh, development from the village's perspective, at least from. Uh, my family's perspective, I think it, it's tremendous, and I'm real happy that you were able to put that deal together. Five years is a fair amount of time, uh, and obviously a lot of change can evolve in those five years, but uh, congratulations, that's, uh, that's great. Thank you. The uh, clubhouse, what, uh, how do you address that? Because that was one of the issues, and, and uh, Ron, you don't have to go into this in a public oh. domain. I, just well, that's okay. The, 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 it's a good. It's a very good question. We've been getting that question quite a bit. The board is planning to meet October 29th to look at a couple options related to the clubhouse. It wouldn't be. Uh, it'd be more interior than anything else. Uh, we don't have the funding to do expand the clubhouse, knock it down, put something up. Uh, there's been conversations originally. What would a um, a modular unit look like? That's been pretty. That we'll we'll share that option, but it's actually a pretty expensive option for us. That probably would have had to come in front of this group. So what we we're trying to do is avoid that and last minute thing. So we, we found a solution. It depends on what the board wants to do. Do they want to hold off a year? It's a little tricky because it's a five year agreement, and how much do you want to put into the building? And so that's something that they have to discuss and determine what's the best course of action. Uh, for the building, but there's no anticipated major structural changes, expansions, things like that. So um, the board has to uh, see how does the, the money raised, um, does that tie into the building, the clubhouse as well? And that'll be dis dis discussions. It'll be a public meeting, discussions with the Golf Association as well. So, um, but yeah, that's the next big topic uh, uh, in the next two weeks. So to that end, um did the did the lease basically state that the golf vision is using everything as is is that kind of as my understanding because they'll take care of maintenance things under ten thousand so they're just kind of assuming the clubhouse is the clubhouse and and all of the things that they see today are as they will use them over the next five years so aside from big ticket items like you say that something completely fails and needs to be replaced so if you were going to do something big a different structure or some major improvement really and i don't mean to be this in kind of a cynical way but the only reason you do that is for the extra revenue above eight hundred thousand. if you thought that this was going to be such a big game changer that they'd bring in so much more revenue you'd do this improvement otherwise they have to deal with things as as they are today. Yeah, they're very happy with as is. Okay, great. Yeah. I mean, that's great. Yeah, yeah that is good. That's cynical. I just, no, uh, no, that's, that's they're they're fine with that. We don't have to make any changes. On our yeah, side. we we've seen some of their other facilities that they're in, and they they're actually pretty pleased. I'm, I wish we could, we can do more with that that facility. I think it needs some freshening up and and things like that. There's other things we have to look at, but they are they are delighted. They they can manage with what they have today. Terrific. Congra I echo Sheriff Peters. Uh, congratulations. Thank That's you. Great news. Uh, it was a teamwork, community, board, staff. So, uh, what are some of the other courses that is in you know, Golf Vision? Yeah, so Bonnie Brook, Foxford Hills, um, uh, Bittersweet on a gurney. Uh -huh. uh, the Foxford Hills is Cary. Uh, the other one is out in Harvard. I, I just played it, so I, I can't remember the name now. Uh, they don't really have a course in the North Shore area, so this would be part of their port portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, they do quite a bit of leases, so they're known for doing leases. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of the Club Village Green in Mundelein, and those are uh, Heather Ridge, I think the nine-hole course. It is a nine-hole course in Gurney. Those are the ones, the closest area around here. So we, we toured the courses that they, they lease or manage. Beautiful courses, beautifully manicured. We talked with their staff on 
beknownst to them that we were coming. So some of the staff, the starters and things like that to make sure that that they understand the Lake Bluff, what, you know, does it match with the Lake Bluff whale? And um, a lot of their employees have been there a long time, so they're starters and things, so that's a demonstration to how they treat their employees. So, uh, and their quality, we, we were really surprised at their quality. They were part of, uh, in 2016, uh, when we went out to RFP for management, they were also part of that um, discussion. Mm -hmm. So, um, they said, you know what, we're going to give a shot again, and, and they did a great job. So we... we great, congratulations, that's yeah, fantastic. Thank you. That's great news. Yeah. Uh, no, the, uh, tremendous, tremendous development, very, very favorable. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, Rio, the draft ordinance, uh, Mr. Salski, and you can certainly stay if you'd like. Uh, I'm not sure anything germane to the Park District will come up, but the Park District's a big player in the end result of Rio or could be a big player so uh, it might not take that long but uh, okay thank you very much uh, Mr. Cole do you want to give us an overview of where we're at certainly so um, again the last few months uh, especially when some new members were seated earlier this year have really been spent um, <clears throat> trying to, to listen to and incorporate some of the new concerns some new interests that came into this process um, certainly have been spent sort of sanding down and, and fine-tuning um, some of the metrics, some of the mechanisms, um, you know, as because, as we've said before, because this goes from sites as small as, you know, less than an acre to over 120 at the golf course, um, it, it, it's challenging in some ways. Um, you know, I, I would reiterate that, you know, it, it'll be hard to get this perfect out of the gate, um, but I think we've come closer and closer and have made a better uh, and better project as, as time has gone on. Um, you know, in this particular case, um, these are fairly technical revisions. I'll run through them real quick. Um, the biggest new addition is before we had this concept of um, of just changes in intensity of use, and maybe that wasn't specific enough, or maybe that didn't provide clear guidance. So we've introduced this concept of significant changes again. This was earlier in our drafts and has come back. Just in terms of defining what's a, what's what's a real change that this group wants to see, what's changes to approved plans that this group wants to see, um, that mechanism coming back rolls back into a couple of, of the other um, things we put in place. So when it comes to um, you know when do you not need a plan to come in? When you're adding trails, when you're adding, when you're changing your building, even now when you're making additions to your building, it looks to that reference of what's a significant change and what's not. Um, to determine if those even need to come back here or if again those can take the streamlined path this group has made um, bypassing here going straight from you know <coughs> a park district board or, or a church um, board what have you straight through to the architectural board of review and then um, to approval by the village board um, again saving time creating efficiencies from that process um, but still also making the framework um, that, that encourages groups to come in early, that encourages groups to plan out multiple years, that tries to encourage some of those behaviors um, Ron talked about, this group has identified. Um, I do want to note, in, in addition, and, and perhaps I jumped ahead, we do have one slight change on the dais for you um, from a remark from one commissioner that, that Ben can explain. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, before I get to that, um, the one thing I'd like to point out is the biggest change, and Glenn hit on this, was section 10-16-9 of the ordinance, um, which talks about that uh, process for amendments to a real plan. So the idea being, you know, that if it's a substantial change, if it hits one of those triggers, it comes back before this body. But if it doesn't, the way that it would be approved is it would go to the village administrator. And the village administrator would make a determination, oh, this is not a substantial change. This doesn't trigger the full review. And the village administrator has authority then to, to approve it. Um, however, it gets reported to the village board, at which point they can either ignore it and say, well, we have no problem with it, or wait a minute, we have a real concern about this, and then they can act to send it back through the process. So there is a check and balance, but the idea is it's, it's to enable a, somebody who has real property to be able to make changes 
without every single time for something real minor to have to go through a lengthy process. Um, so if it's fixing just the facade of a building or, you know, at, you know, or that, you know, minor renovation adds, you know, less than 2% of floor area to a building, you know, something that's really minor, you know, it doesn't have that full process. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands how that process will work under what we have put before you tonight. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer questions on that. Um, the, the other change which just was made today, so we apologize it's not in the packet, but on your dais um, is a new version which has all the changes incorporated that were in your packet, but there's one additional one. And if you turn to page, I guess it's one, two, three, four, uh, in the use table. Um, and the idea, the, the, the question was raised, should we make open uh, spaces a permitted use? And so what we did was add language in the, in, in the use table uh, that begins on the top of page four, recreation and leisure facilities, we added it towards the bottom of that definition that that includes open spaces unobstructed from ground to sky except by facilities specifically designed, arranged, and intended for, for use in conjunction with passive or active outdoor recreation or relaxation. So the idea being that if it's something that is not, let's call it a traditional park, but something that the park district or some other user in the Rio wanted to designate space and use it for open space. So think, think of it kind of, let's call it a forest preserve that may not really have a playground or something that makes it a technical park, arguably, but it's, you know, would be dedicated for recreation, passive or active use, people to walk around, hike, and so forth. It would fall in this definition of open space and would be permitted. That is a different use than a, vi than a vacant lot, which really has no intended use, which just from your zoning code, understand that a vacant lot, because it really doesn't have a use, is, is theoretically permitted in every zoning district. You turn, a house gets torn down and it sits vacant, it's not in violation of your zoning code. It has no use. Um, you know, so, that, so we added that open space to capture, doesn't necessarily have a bunch of structures on it, but it's intended to be used for active or passive recreation or leisure activities. Just wanted to point out that change. Also happy to answer questions on that as well. And if I'm understanding how this is written, if on a master plan, part of that space, because there could be various uses on a parcel of land, mm -hmm. on a property, one of the uses hap happens to be open space and they want to change that use to be something other than open space, a park area or something like that, they would still be permitted to do so, but that would likely be a substantial change based on the change in use, and they would have to update their plan accordingly. So again, it's permitted, but just try, try to, I'm, I'm talking this through for myself to understand it, and also speaking out loud so others can follow me, that that would be our check so just because there's a P in the permitted doesn't give them, doesn't give an owner of a property to just flip back and forth and change uses as they would like on a property. That we would need to see those substantial changes, albeit permitted, uh, per the master plan. Is that, right? Am, so I, I, am I understanding that accurately? Yes, so, so the idea is, I mean, they, they could change within that use category. So in the use table, you know, we have recreation, leisure facilities, um, including without limitation, beaches, parks, playgrounds. So I, I, you know, I, I think we, they would be able to continue to use it for recreation and leisure facilities without necessarily coming back uh, as a substantial change. When we say change in use, you know, we're really going to a different category of use. So let's say, for example, um, you know, we allow you know, a library is a permitted use. So let's say, uh, unlikely, but let's say the park district decided that they wanted to convert one of their parks to a library, even though it's a P, that is a change of use category. 
so that is going to then require them to come back uh, be a substantial change and, and, and come back through the process you know another example might be that we you know if, if you know a church is a permitted use right. so if they bought a lot and said we want to make um, not as an ancillary you know accessory use just put a playground on the church lot but let's say we want to buy up a parcel and really use it for you know a community garden or some other type of thing that use that's not you know then arguably that's a change of use because that lot would not be being used for a church or house of worship okay anymore so it's somewhat case specific because you get into the issue of accessory versus principal okay. use but I, I hope that answers the question i think it does but i've got a clarifying question to further that so let's say you have the forest preserve and it's open space and now you decide to put on a 300 I'm just making up a number, 300 square foot, let's say 500 square foot, uh, and I'm, I should be using something bigger so it <laughs> speaks out to it, but a 500 square foot structure, like, a, you know, they often have places where you could gather with picnic tables and whatnot. You're still using it as a, uh, a park recreational facility. I don't believe that's in the exemptions. Wouldn't that be considered a substantial change, or would that just mm -hmm. be something that I would think so? So even though it's in the same use, that would be a right. substantial enough change that we would see something like that. Correct. So you could be within the so you could be within the same use, and it's not that that the use change that would trigger it would Correct. be something else. So for example, um, we have in here uh, increased by more than two percent of the floor area or building square footage. Correct. That's so, so if they wanted, so if to build all of a sudden say we're going to build a set of classrooms to teach nature courses at our parks, they could, you know, they would come back through the process to amend their master plan if it's not already in there. Yep. Okay. And that was just my. That, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure. That, so change of use as a whole, like open space to library, or even within, you're making a big enough change like we just highlighted with this big you know area um, for meeting if not that would also be a substantial change so we would see those as well but if you had that structure already and wanted to change it slightly that kind of falls within either the exemptions or could theoretically be approved as a minor change without having to go having to go through the minor or without having to go through the master plan um, by the uh, village administrator as being over with the oversight being the village board mm -hmm. okay yes all right I'm cool. as long as we talk about two percent I there's one thing that popped out to me I was I missed the last meeting so maybe that was explained but what you know you've got the two percent variance in in changes referenced um, on these in page 15 or so what where how where did two percent come from versus five percent versus one percent? I just so so it, I I will start by saying it's within your discretion to set the percentage as, as you believe appropriate. So the, the where it originally came from was really a, a, we've looked at a bunch of different planned development ordinances and many of them use one percent as a is a trigger for a substantial change and in discussions that our office had with with village staff uh it was this, we decided in here to use two percent i mean i think the intent was for example let's say that minor modifications were really being made to the interior of a building so and part of putting on let's just call it new siding or fixing a wall it adds a small let's call it fairly de minimis amount of floor area the idea is it shouldn't trigger going back through a whole process so you know two percent was thought to be kind of where that demarcation line should be if you think it should be one percent or five percent or you know whatever you think the magic number is i wouldn't say that this is there's a it was just viewed as somewhat de minimis and an appropriate at two percent it just seems small to me i mean two percent on a mm -hmm. five thousand yeah. twenty five hundred square foot structure is is nothing yeah. so the, so the one so, but i mean the, the other the I, counter the counterbalance to that and then this is the, the other thing that we discussed with staff was one of the things you can understand the concern would be is if one of the users of a real property said this year i'm going to do this project and i'm going to add on you know 
let's call it one or two percent, mm -hmm. and then six months later, because I don't want to trigger this whole review, I'm going to do it again, and then a year later again, and the year after that, and so five years from now, what started as a one percent or two percent or whatever that change is starts to add up, and then the building that you started with, you know, looks and feels very different in terms of its zoning impact. So. It's, again, it's a policy decision of you think 5% or 10% or whatever number you think is appropriate, but those were kind of the factors that were discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Sam, last, last month there was no, those provisions weren't in there at all. It was 0%, that was a hard line if right. someone wanted to add one square foot. And I cited the example of if one of the churches wanted to put a little covered entryway in the back coming in and it was 50 square feet or something, they weren't allowed to do it. So then the board had a discussion. Everybody felt, yes, we ought to somehow allow these de minimis right. changes. So that's just how we got from last month where nothing was allowed right. to um, these suggested de minimis changes. And I, I just would like to throw out, I'm happy with the 2%. Right. Um, as you start looking at the bigger structures like the schools, 2% can become a, a very big um, number on the other hand, whereas for a 4,000 square foot church, that's like 80 square feet that would maybe cover some little addition over a door. And then just to clarify for me, because you didn't say it, Ben, and for all the other members, any of these changes that involve something to the outside of a building or any type of addition are still going to go to the architectural board of review. And so they're going to be able to see, you know, this, those types of mm -hmm. changes. That's correct, right? The That's way correct. it still stands today. Yeah. Correct. So to add a bit of context, Sam, um, the big, we brought in that list of issues, list of things still outstanding last month. Mm -hmm. I mean, the big focus was this de minimis change issue. How do we add more flexibility? How do we focus in on that um, and, and not worry so much about some of the other question mark hanging out there. We still fine tune a couple of those a little bit just based on how we've kept analyzing these sites, but um, that was really our focus. That's where this came from. Right, well, I, I, I appreciate it because there's a lot of good content in here and I think it ma mm. makes a lot of sense. I was just, I didn't know if 2% was an arbitrary number and it just in some ways it seems very minimal and if. We wanted know, to be 100% better than the others, so we did two instead of one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> So, is a minor change anything that's not a substantial change? How do we define it? C correct. So, so minor change is not really a defined term per se, but it's so. But if you look at 10-16-9, the village administrator may approve changes to an approved Rio development plan that do not, in the sole and absolute discretion of the village administrator, constitute a substantial change. Um, to the Rio development in accordance with the following procedure. So if it doesn't meet one of these triggers, then it is not a substantial change and then proceeds through so this. So it has to go through the village administrator and the village board. Right, so the village administrator can then approve it and notifies uh, the board. And then within 60 days of receipt of the notice submitted by the village administrator, the board shall either ratify the approval by resolution, deny it, um, you know, and any minor change denied may be reclassified as substantial change and then go back through the process. So there would be this, you know, an, an ability there um, to kind of have a double check on the village administrator. Is there any change that doesn't fall in either of these two categories that just gets automatically accepted and gets done without anybody looking at anything? Uh, so interior changes things that don't deal with, with zoning. So, you know, if, if a church wanted to repaint its community room, that's not going to come. But any exterior. Village. But the exterior, well, it might be the ABR. Um, but it'll be somebody. But any, any change to the exterior, you know, intensity of use, change in use, uh, it will be either a substantial change or a minor. And then my other question, is it fairly common in, in uh, my undermined change number four. Mm -hmm. I've seen this before in other, other things that we've done where if nothing 
gets acted on in 60 days, it's automatic. Is that fairly standard language? It is, uh, you know, and it's and it's done with the intent of, you know, if you said the village board must act, then what happens if we don't? We can't bind the village board and say you must take up this matter and adopt a resolution one way or the other. So there needs to be some clarity, and it's also written, to be honest, to, to benefit the applicant. So they have an ability to move forward in the event that the village decides to sit on its hand. So what it says, and I'm, I'm reading from 10.16.9, um, subsection C, uh, Sorry, uh, B4, right. the failure of the village board to ratify or deny a minor change within 60 days of the date of receipt of notice thereof shall be deemed a ratification of the minor change. So that way everybody has certainty. And it's also a good legal exercise, it's, it's, it's a good legal um, provision in the sense of we want clarity, uh, so whether it's the neighbors, it, you know, so they have certain rights to be able to challenge. They know when the clock starts ticking whether it's the applicant knows if, if there's a real issue, they have the right to pursue certain remedies. The village, everybody in the village knows when something goes into effect. So it's our recommendation that if we have a provision like that, that creates the clarity. And if the village board says we're absolutely fine with this, but we really don't care about wasting our time on an agenda over something so minor, we're just gonna let this go, it'll go into effect and they don't have to act. Is that if there's an applicant and he's got he's doing some sort of minor um, structure repair or whatever, it, it, is it sixty days plus whatever you know time in front of him? Does he have to wait essentially that entire time before he ends up performing whatever work needs to be done? You know, and in this case, you know, some sort of structure over the back door, or is that does he does the applicant? realize that this is really nothing he's gotten assurances from the village administrator well, and he just goes ahead and with the work and then what happened I mean, well so it so this would be changes to a master plan so let's clarify what that means so a typical let's say there's a roof leak and you're dealing with patching a hole on the roof you know that's not a change to a master plan right because you're going to think about it this way we approve our zoning just like when you have a special use plan uh, a special use before you, or any type of, of variation. You have site plans, you're gonna have your bu you know, building plans and so forth that are gonna, you know. So deviating from what's approved is the real issue. So patching a hole in the roof is not going to be something that deviates, or shouldn't deviate from a site plan. So it's not gonna be anything that would require even an application for a <coughs> minor change if it's saying, I want to fix something in accordance with already what's approved. Right. It's the deviation from that. So it, I, don't, I don't think it would preclude at all a church or the park district from saying we have a repair we need to make as long as you're doing it in accordance with your plan. Now, if the repair does something that is not in accordance with the approved zoning relief, you know, then you're going to have to come be, before uh, the village. And that's the same thing as if you have a, for any applicant who has a special use in, in, in the village or, you know, or a variation or something like that in which a repair or modification is going to be deviating from what's been approved. Mm -hmm. Or like in the awning example, the mm -hmm. church with the awning, that would have to go to the ABR anyway. Right. So it's going right. to no. be a minor oh, change. Right, you're right. It's going to be a minor change. The right. village administrator will probably Mm -hmm. approve it as a minor change and then the ABR will look at it to make sure it's done well and then the village board will ratify that it's a minor change. Now, and, and, and is, that, it, yeah. is that correct in terms of the process? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and I guess to also clarify in the case of an emergency, let's say an emergency repair that's needed that does for whatever reason the fix does require a deviation. The other thing that the village can do, and things that we have done in the past, um, is that applicant would apply, understand, you know, understanding that there's risk of waiting, going through this process for 60 plus days. You know, they can, you know, the, the village might consider allowing them to proceed at their own risk, understanding that if that 
application is rejected, they may have to make an additional change to get back into compliance with what has been approved. And it's, so the basically, I mean, and it's the same thing that, again, for anybody who gets zoning relief. Okay. Thank you. I have one other um, question about 10167B, 10, about the building commission having explicit authority to waive required application mm -hmm. items. What does that mean? So we have in the ordinance uh, um, a list of application requirements, um, different submittals that must be made uh, is part of the application. Um, and what we are, you know, and sometimes something may require a deviation from a, a approved plan, uh, but to go through and to submit all of the various application materials would be unnecessary, not helpful to your review because it may be a fairly minor thing. And so we're allowing a process to say, you don't need to go out and get a whole bunch of really expensive extraneous drawings stuff. and extraneous stuff that has nothing to do with It has nothing need. to do with the approval process. No. It's just the application. It's process. the application. And then, in addition, if it comes before this body and you say, but no, no, we really need that because we don't have enough information, you can always go back and tell the applicant, go back and get this done and taken care of. That's always your prerogative. Um, but it's meant to provide some flexibility. Again, the goal of this process was not intended to make it overly onerous, expensive on an applicant um, to make changes if need be. Member Murray. Mr. Chairman, I think most of the comments in the room have addressed the concerns. I, I, I'd echo the comments that I, I, I like the progress that's been made uh, in terms of including de minimis exemptions. I, I don't think anyone here uh, has a particular desire to impose more process than is necessary for everyday ordinary course changes, but, uh, but I do like the rigor that remains with respect to fundamental changes of use. I think that that's the the paramount concern for most community interests, and uh, so I'm glad to see that those have remained uh, in in full form in, in the current draft of the ordinance. But I, I don't have further comments uh, tonight. Great, thank you very much. Um, from my perspective, uh, I must commend village staff and uh, village council for continuing to address the concerns raised by the commissioners um, I, I think we're at that point now where we've got a, a draft ordinance that's been fine-tuned rather extensively, assuming that at some point it does pass, maybe in a revised format, but does pass. We'll always have the opportunity to revisit, make modifications. It's not etched in stone. So um, I think we're at the point in the process that uh, we may be in a position to set the matter for public hearing because uh, our goal was to wrap this up before the end of 2018. Um, any further discussions tonight? Yeah, and I, I don't want to uh, step on the procedural toes, but is this an appropriate time while we have Mr. Salsky in the room to get feedback, or does that need to wait until we have public comment? Like official public, you know, like a public hearing, or can we get that feedback now if he's had a chance to review this or just comment on our discussions? I figure while he's here, it'd be interesting to get some feedback, if appropriate. Yeah, um, Mr. Salsky's welcome to. I will say we weren't, we were originally expecting someone else from the Park District. Okay. So we just, we, we, we extended the offer to hear our conversation since it's, it's been a while. So I don't know that he's um, had a chance to review this. I, I wouldn't expect him to. Okay. Um, part of, one request the Park District made along the way was to have um, some time to review this in advance of a public hearing. Um, per perhaps by using you know a, a design consultant, I think uh, Mr. Saucy used Hitchcock Design for some of your planning. So to have them who would be facilitating the park district going through this process, uh, take a look at it themselves and be able to provide some commentary too. So they haven't seen this latest. They have not seen. Okay, this so maybe it's yet. not the right time anyway. So yeah. okay. But I think our our thinking and, and Mr. Saucy maybe you can say if this is if you're comfortable with this is. You know, you'll get this for sure. You'll have at least 30 days before the public hearing to consult with your consultants. No pun intended. And then any any additional comments they have could be in the context of the, of the hearing. Great. 
And, and just to remind everybody about the process, so this is one of two parts to the process. So the first has to be, obviously, we do the text amendments to create the zoning district and with you know, the process that we've, you've seen. The other is the map amendments that will move property from their current zoning districts into the Rio district. Uh, so that's the other piece to this. And, you know, I, I'm not sure on the, the exact timing of that, but that can be done at the same thing concurrently as part of the same type of hearing process or separately. Uh, but there are, there are technically two pieces to this. I'm and not the, oh, go ahead, member Russell. The question, would we have to have for the public hearing, would we have to have at least the draft map so that the public could understand what properties are being transferred to the Rio? So prior, so prior to the meeting, there will have to be, there'll be newspaper notice and so forth, and we will have to identify what properties we're talking about. That will be part of the public notice, that will be part of the agenda, that will be part of the packet, whether it's done by address legal description or if it's done by literally a map, you know, in your packet that will kind of show, uh, you know, it can be done multiple multiple ways in terms, you know, in terms of information. Um, but we will have to identify those properties beforehand. So it's not as if, for example, that night we just go, and I think this property and that property should go in. <laughs> Rather, they will have to be pre-identified. And so everybody has an opportunity, every property owner who will be affected will have an opportunity, neighbors will have an opportunity, and then they can comment as part of the public hearing on whether they think it's appropriate or not appropriate um, to be placed into uh, the Rio zoning district. And we do, uh, we do have an exhibit back from when this started. Uh, I know there's a couple parcels that need to be brought into it, um, but we're, I and mean, that's pretty close to done at this point. As far as the the map and which would be the actual zoning map of the village once adopted and then from there probably breaking out an address list or something similar does body take a look at the map before it gets put out the public display just so we in case we get asked questions or we have comments Certainly. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a, a timing question I guess we can try to put it up here real quick maybe if I can find it for you I guess what we're what we're looking at now is we can definitely distribute it. We can leave a bit of time um, to get some feedback in. Mm -hmm. um, I think as we'll talk about, we've got some time before a hearing. It's just more in the sense of given some of the other things going on, um, if you want to have a, another meeting before then, or if that can just happen um, by correspondence. I think it can happen by cor in my mind. Correspondence works. Yeah. Okay. Same here. Okay. If I can add just one more thing. And this, the other thing, just in part because people are listening, but you know, may listen to this, but for all your understanding as well, if property is moved to the Rio District, it doesn't mean that they have to change anything that they're, that they're doing. It does not make them non-compliant and, and therefore an illegal use or require them to come in for a Rio master plan or do anything. It just means they will be future changes are, will be into that land will be governed by the Rio zoning district. So they can stay the way they are, and if they want to do something, build a new building, change the use, you know, new addition, something that may trigger one of the triggers, then and only then would they be required to go through that process. So want to just. If, if, if anybody has any questions about that, I'm happy to discuss. But it, again, it does not change um, or make somebody not compliant in violation of our code. So I'm just trying to think through different situations and take, for instance, a church that has um, the, um, the pastor's house right next door. The entire property is put into the, this new district, but you really have a typical residential house that happens to be owned by the same entity. Does that house actually go into the new zoning district or does that stay uh, separate in R4 zoning where it is today? It, it's a decision that's up to you. Um, when we originally put this together, we anticipated a couple situations like that. Yeah. Uh, at least at that time, 
the, the staff recommendation was leave them in their underlying zoning just because it's better suited for that purpose. Right, that's what I was thinking. So yeah. the manse, um, right, you know, thinking Union the church, manse. Right, right. It, it looks like an R4 house. It, right. it complies with zoning. You should do that. Um, the community church offices in the central business district yeah. could easily be taken up by another tenant. Right. Um, probably makes sense to leave those in that district. They don't really benefit from right. you know, this flexibility. Um, there are a couple other isolated situations like that. I'm uh, not usually a proponent for additional meetings. Um, however, I think in this instance, it might be the most efficient approach to schedule a special meeting for the public uh, for the public hearing uh, dedicated solely to Rio. And so, hopefully, we could work our way through it that night and. Uh, uh, make the necessary recommendation to the board following that meeting you know if we can get it on the schedule uh, that's my thought but certainly welcome to uh, other discussion I'm, I'm open to it um, but it would be interesting to know if we anticipate additional content for the next meeting and that's what's kind of precipitating an additional meeting or if it's something that if there's a late agenda, is it too early to know what next month is gonna look like? Too early to know. So we can have a brief conversation. This is sort of teasing into another agenda item, but it's a short conversation. Um, so you know, next month, your regular meeting date falls um, immediately before Thanksgiving, which probably isn't ideal. Um, at this time, it, it looks like there will be no you know, outside petitions on that agenda. It would all be um, village originated business so there's no um, nothing that would you know that we can foresee there being harm um, in in canceling that meeting or in moving it around um, your last meeting for the year then regularly scheduled it's we're already talking about that well is um, December 19th so a week before Christmas um, I would suggest to you as a starting point um, it probably makes sense to put uh, tentatively, we'll, we'll make sure the scheduling works, to put a special sometime before the 19th, probably at least a week before, um, so that, you know, if there's a need to continue, um, that you have the 19th to be able to parse through any extra issues or, or continue to hear public comment, anything like that. Um, but still, again, in the hopes of um, preserving your ability, if, if it's ripe to do so, um, you know, making a, a recommendation in the, in the same month. Um, again, December, same thing. At this point, we only foresee village-initiated business. Um, I do want to point out there are some, um, you know, there's, there's always possibilities. Um, so uh, as you might be aware, there's a, a plan proposed for the new PNC Bank that's being circulated among neighbors. Um, so that is not an application to the village yet. That's not anything before this body yet, but that may occur. Um, there, there's, of course, um, you know, things like Stonebridge. Again, no reason to think that there's an application forthcoming, but there always could be. Um, and th so there are certainly things that could come up in the next few months that we have to be prepared for, in addition to any of our ordinary casework, in addition to Rio, in addition to um, trying to return to and make some more progress on the comprehensive plan, now that we have Rio um, packaged up and hopefully with a bow on it. Should we move the Thanksgiving, day before Thanksgiving, to that Tuesday, possibly, or Monday? If you want to preserve the ability to do business in November, you could certainly do that. I, mean, I, I don't know if I'd be here the night before Thanksgiving. Yeah, that would not be ideal. So the, for if you did want to meet that week, the evening of the 19th, that's open for village business. What day is that? That's Monday. I'm OK with that. So probably premature to put your Rio meeting at that time. Again, um, f just for notice as well, we'd have to notice it almost immediately. Um, but if you want to preserve your ability to do business, and then you could always cancel. That's oh, I option. see. So the special meeting you're referring to would be somewhere between November 21st, 19th, 21st. Between that and the December meeting, is that what we're thinking? Based on your, co your comment? Glenn, now that would that would be my recommendation. Yeah, we could we could make the 19 work, but we'd be we'd be sprinting to put it together. Okay, I, I'm okay either way. I'm I'm fine with the special meeting if that's best. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, further discussion? Just that an observation that if you really committed to the park district to give them 30 days, that, um, you, yeah. it's almost, it's almost hmm. impossible to have the yeah. special meeting on the 19th. 30 days and not a second more. Yes. Yeah, you have to have the whole document out to them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. But I thought we'd just reschedule our regular meeting that week to the 19th, and then if we need a special meeting after that, yeah. so you can certainly send out a memo we can, with a bunch of dates. Certainly. Well, the, yeah, we will have to. So if we set um, Rio for a special meeting, we'll have to decide that date relatively soon. It doesn't have to be here and now, but. Um, Why don't you see yeah. what, from yours and Ben's perspective in the village, and then put some dates out there for us Okay. Online. We can do that for you. We always give you a... But are we going to meet on the 19th then? Yeah, I'd be okay with the 19th for moving our regularly scheduled meeting to the 19th. And then if there isn't any non-village related activity, we'll just continue the meeting. Right. Yeah, we'll just... We'll call it. I mean, if there's a substantive petition that we should address, then we'll convene. Right. Otherwise, we... So we're going to meet on the 19th, then, correct? Okay. Do we need a motion? Are we good? Um, I think we're good. No, we do fine. And then Rio will try to set a special meeting sometime during the first 10 or 12 days of December? I'd say so, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Probably closer to the 1st than to the 12th. All right. Great. Um, uh, from a perspective of Rio, I think we've done everything we can tonight, and uh, we appreciate it, Mr. Salsky, for your sticking around, just so you got a better pulse on what's going on and, and the rel relative timetables. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, agenda item number five. Well, now it becomes number six, I guess. Um, text amendment concerning signs. Certainly, give me just one moment here. So I will note uh, an error on my part, as you can tell by the cover memo. The point of this is not to do paddle court business once again. I, I apologize for the error. Um, this is a slate of minor, um, well, not minor, but miscellaneous changes recommended. Um, by the Architectural Board of Review, which is responsible for administering um, the sign chapter of the zoning code. <clears throat> so again, even though this body has jurisdiction um, over recommending changes to this chapter of the code, um, the, the Architectural Board of Review administers it day to day, as it were, or month to month anyway. And, and so this is a selection of changes that they've, they've um, put together um, based on their experiences. They've presented, they've workshopped it with a few meetings. Mike Croak, um, the staff liaison to that board is here. Um, if there's any questions. They presented to the village board previously with a favorable recommendation and, um, well, not a recommendation, but favorable reception, I would say. And so this is the um, formal step of, uh, of, putting, of putting those changes into place and making sure they have this board body's approval and recommendation for, for adoption by the board. Um, so to list them off, uh, you know, to understand what's changing, short ordinance may be best to read it. Um, but in summary, um, there's some changes directed towards light pollution, trying to reduce unnecessary light on signage, keep it to the right places, the light, the right hours. Um, trying to make awning signs more generally applicable. Um, you know, right now they require, um, I believe, an exception to use in many cases, even though they're common and, and desirable. Um, but also introduce some new requirements as far as making those more uniform. We have multiple tenants in a building. Um, again, door and window signs right now, probably too restrictive and frequently exempted from. And so allowing those in more places with just re regulations as far as permissible area of the window of the door. Um, clarify the treatment of ground signs from multi-tenant buildings. So one per property, not one per tenant. You don't get, you, know, you can't line them up like yard signs. And, uh, and finally, um, clarifying that for ground signs in industrial districts, um, the square footage is, is per side and not necessarily um, in the aggregate. Um, so again, a handful of minor changes that this group has developed over the past few months. 
And again, this is at the recommendation of the ABR and, and with the um, not formal approval, but the support of the village board. Yeah, I mean, the, the village board, had, they made no motion or anything like that, but they heard these changes along with others proposed by the architectural board of review. I'm um, at a committee of the whole meeting, I think, back in uh, uh, this February. That, that went by pretty fast. Oh. <laughs> All right. Commissioners, any discussion? I'm, I'm in agreement with all the changes. I do have a question about the very last proposed change on the last page there for the ground signs. Right now, there's a, the regulation reads you're allowed, in the industrial district, you're allowed 64 square feet. Um, and we're making that change to clarify that both sign faces would be counted individually as I read it, but what, what really perplexed me about the suggestion is that the, the size of the sign is measured from the ground. Um, I would think that this is gonna have the, the effect, as long as everybody understands that, of reducing the um, size of the, sizes of these signs, because I can't imagine in reality, if you have a sign on a multi-tenant building, um, that most people are gonna want the sign, they're gonna want the 64 square feet that they have now, but the bottom of the sign will literally have to be at grade. There's, no, there's not even allowance for one foot from the bottom of the sign being up. There's, usually there's flower beds around a lot of signs or something, and I was just very surprised to see that and just wanna make sure that the ABR understands that in effect what I think they're doing is re e reducing the allowable size of a sign face even on these bigger multi-tenant buildings by doing this, at least, at least the way I understand the practicality of it by counting from literally grade up. Well, yeah, it is an interesting point to talk about, George. Um, the um, existing wording in the code said the base is counted. So most of the signs in the L1 and L2 district were being measured down to grade. But then the North Shore University healthcare system came in with a sign on, on poles or piers, you know, with bushes underneath that didn't have a base. And they said, well, you know, we don't have to count that square footage. Other people were doing a brick base down to the ground. And they said, well, you know, we don't have a base. It's just on poles, so we don't have to count that square footage. So we clarified it so that somebody putting a sign on poles is really on the same, uh, you know, level playing field with the people who are doing a, uh, a brick base under their signs where the base was always counted. And, and that's what the ABR wanted. Okay. Other comments, other discussion? In section 3J1, it says it'll be illuminated during the hours when intended for viewership. When most signs want to be overnight, on overnight to display their building, like the, the North Shore building, wouldn't that be 20, wouldn't it be on all night? Though? Well, you know, that is a good question. We did have some discussion of, of that, and um, I, I think there's kind of a, um, th that is something that we decided to leave open to the ABR's subjective, um, you know, ability to determine what's appropriate to the situation when they consider a, each new sign application because you know if you have say the canals auto plaza on 41 well if they're not selling cars on sunday are you going to make them turn that sign off on sunday you know maybe maybe not for that situation but on the other hand another situation you know it's on the east end of downtown next to a residential area or something maybe that should be off when you know, because why, why does anyone need to see that even on, in hours that they're not open? So the ABR decides the hours. Yeah, so the ABR can decide that as, as they review the application okay. as, as warranted for the situation. I'm okay with it. the changes. Great. Member Badger. I'm okay as well. Member Murray. Likewise, Mr. Chairman, no comments. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Could I have a motion, please? I move we recommend the uh, changes to the sign uh, ordinance regulations as proposed. Second. 
So move. Uh, could we have a vote, please? Certainly. Once again, the order is random. Member Burns. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Russell. Aye. Member Badger. Aye. Member Murray. Aye. Chair Peters. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Uh, next agenda item is, well, we've got the public hearing for text amendments concerning parking and business and industrial districts. Uh, my understanding is that that might be a little more time consuming than uh, we anticipate. So my thought process is maybe to continue that to a date uh, not certain in the future if, uh, if the uh, commissioners are comfortable with that. And for initial context, both of these were based on the Smedbo discussion um, last month. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're not in a rush. You know, their proposal isn't make or break based on taking these up anytime in the very near future. Um, you know, probably around the end of the year is when they would be making their decisions. Um, so certainly some of these are pretty meaty changes. We're not trying to rush those along. We want to give you plenty of time. Um, but happy to answer initial questions or we can leave this for another day. Depends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with leaving it for another day. There was some, you're right, there was some pretty big changes, a lot being asked in that, in that one file. So, um, some more time. To we work. need a, okay. uh, Ben? So if you decide to do this, to take this up on another day, there's a couple of things, one of which is the typical way we would do this is a motion to continue to a date certain. So if you pick a date, you know, December 19th, then you would move to continue to that date and save the date. If you do not and you want to leave it open, just understand that the village will have to send out notice of the public hearing once again. So uh, there's a couple ways to do this, uh, one of which is if you know when you think you will take it up to continue to that date, and if that changes, we can always re-notice. Um, so, and if you really aren't sure when we're gonna take it up, you, you can just con continue it without to a date certain, just staff will have to send out a notice again. If we try. Or, or I should say publish notice in the newspaper again. Yeah, if we try it and we miss, we just send out notice yeah. again. Is it reasonable to look at just a Smedbow parking with the height that we do now, so we don't have to ad readdress them and then come did, back for the rest of the L1, L2 district with the parking later on. We gave you that option as well. So there's a second ordinance in here that just makes the bare minimum changes at this point um, for Smedbo to proceed and then um, leaves the broader question for a different day as well. Yeah, and my thought is that we address the other proposed amendment yet this evening uh, but just continue the parking discussion to a later date, perhaps the uh, January 2019 meeting, if that works. Okay. January 2019. Gosh, I'm going to have to, I got to open up my new calendar already. Whew. Okay. All right. Um, Agenda item number seven, public hearing for text amendments concerning the L1 and L2 districts. Is there a motion? Oh, yes, we do need to. Oh. Yeah, we, need, we need a motion. Okay. And a second. Do we have a motion with respect to uh, the proposed text amendments concerning parking and business and industrial districts? Move to continue. continue the discussion on this to discuss the public hearing pub sorry public hearing till January 19th uh, looks like regularly scheduled, January regularly scheduled January meeting yeah the 16th 16th yeah is there a second second, second. all right could we have a vote please what can be a voice vote just all in favor all in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> Sounds so thrilled. <laughs> forgot to remember. All right. Murray was there. He forgot to say his name, though, so it doesn't count. <laughs> Mem member Murray votes aye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, agenda, agenda item number seven. 
uh, public hearing for text amendments concerning the L1 and L2 districts. Uh, Mr. Cole, if you could give us a brief overview. Certainly, brief overview. And then you have these two pages in front of you at the, the desk. If you want to pull them out, that might be helpful as an illustrative tool as we, we talk. So um, given our continuation, we do have um, a little bit of a different discussion, perhaps. And that, again, we do have a variation in this ordinance that has um, sort of bare minimum changes necessary to get um, that proposed Medmo development set for parking as well as for um, this height concern. Uh, but this height concern, again, an, an issue um, that uh, at least last month we heard um, a desire from the PCZA, ZBA to look at more globally in the business parks. And so we wanted to bring you um, a, a short, sweet discussion item to do that. So for a bit of context, the Waukegan Road Corridor study back um, earlier this decade, believe it or not, um, said you know at that time with the tenant mix we had here in the business park um, that you should take that height limit all the way up to 40 feet to try and retain some of those businesses. That new warehousing, new light manufacturing, that the sort of the, the entry level height was um, you know 40 feet for the ceiling to give you enough room for this machinery, for warehouse stacks, things of that nature. Um, since that time, a lot has changed in this district, I think certainly. Um, the, this, as we've talked about in our comprehensive plan discussions, this district is becoming more retail focused, more office focused, more of a, this interesting blend of uses. And so 40, uh, our, our thought as staff, probably goes a bit too much, too much but too high. Um, our thinking is, you know, as, as you heard from the Smedbo property proposal last month, is that offices with open floor plans with taller ceilings are running in about the 15 feet, um, you know, four to four ratio. So you have here is, right here is, you know, this floor and then 15 feet up through a ceiling, through mechanical spaces, through ductwork, through everything else, you have another floor and then 15 feet above that you have your roof. Um, our thought then too is, you know, if you have bad grades or if you have other um, interesting circumstances. If you leave a couple feet of fudge room, that makes sure we don't have a variation for, for silly reasons or we're not making people grade unnecessarily, things like that. There's still a two-story restriction. You still can't have three stories on a lot. Um, yeah, so these maps give you an idea of heights in the L1 district as built. Um, in addition, this data wasn't around for Target. Target comes up to 26 at most of the buildings. <laughs> but the, um, the box right there that defines the front entry actually goes up to 32, which I, I didn't know when I wrote this, so hmm. handy coincidence. Hmm. Um, you can see there's at least one major building there that's built at the 32 line. There's quite a few that go above, um, at or above the 25 feet line, but it's just based on, this is based on building files, it's just based on measured height. Um, but so certainly there's some precedent in this area as it is for going a bit taller. Um, the one other thing I did want to point out, um, maybe for a bit of discussion, again, an easy one to discuss, most of the buildings in this district are flat roofs. You can see in this whole part of town, there's really <coughs> just two um, peaked roofs. One is in the south loop, that's the racket courts, which have these two peaked roof situations. And the second over there in Canals, there's sort of this, this square peaked roof. Now, as it is today, we say that you know when you're measuring height, um, you go to the tallest part of the building that's that's actually the roof. So you leave out things like parapet walls, screening, turrets, elevators, things like that. Um, you know, if there is a desire to see or to enable at least more of this, um, you know, peaked roof style of construction right now, that's probably at a disadvantage. Um, we do have some example language in here from Chicago that says you have a peaked roof. You take the middle part of the roof, that's your height for these purposes. So you do allow a bit more penetration over the line, um, but you know, probably not in a way that really um, is, can be exploited or you know, it doesn't give you a whole lot of extra space, just gives you another architectural tool in the toolbox for people that want to make that additional investment. Right. Let's open it up for a general discussion. Who wants to jump in? Just a thought. There's a business park a little bit further north, um, Norman Woods, 
uh, and uh, on Waukegan Road in, Wa in Waukegan uh, that has uh, one of their um, development uh, in the development agreement all the buildings in there have to have mansard roofs and uh, just that's way the guy who originally developed the uh, the park uh, put those covenants in what it to uh, Glenn's point is that it's an architectural design looks kind of cool much more expensive um, and but functionally doesn't really serve any purpose so um, but there's a continuity in that park, which you'd never get here because of the, the, the age and, and the disparity of buildings, but it happens out there. I have no further comment. I, I think it's fine for the purposes uh, in the context of the applicant that, or the, the workshop person. I, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to spending more time on the more comprehensive views for the parking. Um, I'm fine with the, the, the height, though, 32 feet height. Okay. Thank you, Member Miller. Member Badger, uh, just to follow up on your discussion quickly, are you a proponent of the Mansard requirement or uh, just a general comment? Yeah, I was just a comment. I, I guess that um, I would be in favor of if somebody wanted to add that and came to us somewhere down the line that um, – you know, wanted to use that architectural process or that design element, I would, you know, probably, without seeing it, of course, but I would, you know, off the top of my head, I would encourage that, because I think it is a um, attractive element that, that may be for a, a variance somewhere down the line. That being said, um, for this discussion, I'm, you know, I'll um, agree with Member Burns in terms of the, the proposed changes here. I was surprised, actually, though, looking at the different height regulations and, and how it's different in for Block 1 versus the rest of the Central Business District. And, and then I'm surprised, obviously, that, that, that light industrial, the, the, the uh, regulation stated 25 feet, uh, which is less than the anywhere else in, in, in the village. And then I was even more surprised for some residences can have a f up to 44 feet. Depends on the lot size. Depends on the lot size. But I, I, I mean, I didn't know that table was going to look like that when I started writing. <laughs> I, it's, I'm looking. I'm like, well, that's kind of all over the place. But, um, well, yeah. And I mean, think I about some that, of the. It doesn't. You know, I guess for the purposes of what were the argument here, that it's just an interesting comment, but. Yeah, and I think we should follow up to that at some point in connection with our comprehensive plan discussions. I think this is a fine start, but one of the things in our comprehensive plan, our draft, is to make things more uh, attractive in the light industrial area for development. And so I'm not convinced that 32 is the final resting place for this. I think it's fine for now, but we may want to reconsider that if we really are trying to make this attractive. Is there uh, any downside from a economic perspective of perhaps uh, requiring the mansard roof in L1? I mean, will it detract or will it enhance uh, opportunities? No. Um, no, I think it would. Uh, it might be an extra burden on somebody. Um, and then there's plenty of buildings that are, are are attractive, it, you know, it's a beauty in the eye of the beholder. I mean, that's, um, I would not be in favor of requiring a mansard roof. Um, you know, I would probably, if we started really getting into it, I would probably be more um, likely to be lenient in terms of buildings that were designed to be, have a higher ceilings or higher roofs further into the park versus that's right there on, on Waukegan just because of its placement and entry into the village and all that. Um, you know, some of those discussions I'd be happy to have, but I'm, for the purposes of this one exercise, I'm, I'm certainly okay with. What's a mansard roof? So, uh, you know, angled, you know, an angled roof that usually you see in industrial buildings or office buildings, you don't see that and you have a flat roof, but this one designer and the one owner, you know, just really, uh, I'm trying to think of it, maybe some of the U-line buildings are 
have those angled roofs at the top of an industrial there we go ah it's got actually two different slopes it's like a barn right yeah it's yeah. like a barn more like barn a barn more. it's like versailles oh. yeah the uline buildings in wisconsin the new okay. ones are yeah very well, attractive those, to make yeah, sure. that for sure <laughs> yeah but that's a that's you know that's a, sort of a different animal certainly so but i would not be in favor of requiring it but i would certainly be in favor of leniency if somebody wanted to do it because i think it it might be an attractive design element. Well, I, I think we have a we've got checks and balances in place with respect to the ABR because uh, obviously the concern is on Waukegan Road and certainly the concern with Smedbro property is that if and when it's developed, it does present well because it is the uh, entrance point from the south side of mm -hmm. Waukegan Road. So, uh, Member Murray. You know, I, I, I also found the, the materials uh, less controversial than interesting, uh, and, and I echo the comment that was made, and I apologize for not being able to identify who it was, um, uh, about the variations within the Central Business District. But that is probably a topic for a later conversation. Um, when I look at the proposals before us, I, I think that they're, they're reasonable and consistent with the discussions that we had around L1 and L2 around the Smedbo property, and, and I'm inclined to be supportive. Thank you. Uh, Member Miller. I have no additional comments. I'm, I have, I'm in agreement with this proposal. Thank you. Member Russell. Same, same opinion. Don't, don't have any concerns with the uh, alternative B as we're discussing and presenting. All right. Any, uh, any further discussion, or should we entertain a motion? I move we recommend approval of the uh, ordinance uh, sublabeled alternative B parking. We have a second. Hold up. Parking or building? building. No nope. parking changes. So there are. I think we've been discussing oh, this. Maybe we back up here. So there are two alternatives here. Yeah. One yeah. is just the height. And the second one was, if we if we didn't have the comfort to make the uh, bigger okay. parking changes, here's the minimum for what um, to to be able to legally construct the site plan that you saw last month. Thank you. So I that changes the dimensions. Yeah. It's Thank just you. This one versus the other one. So B allows the project, the Smedbo project, to go forward. Yep. Correct. Height As and parking. parking. Yeah. And parking. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. So sorry for cutting off. And maybe to be clear in case people haven't read this, so that changes the stall dimension, that changes the aisle dimension, that allows parking 50 feet towards Waukegan Road, as we've talked about, that allows um, parking under more conditions in side yards, again, as we've talked about previously. Question before we, with our previous discussion with, our, with the Rio, we weren't going to allow, we, we set a setback from state highways of 100 feet in the Rio. And now we're saying now we're doing 50 feet in L1, L2. Is that a conflict of what we, our intention is? So as far as, uh, at least as far as buildings go, it, it'll still be 100 in both places. We allow 50 for parking? Yeah, what, what about parking in Rio? Is that? Yeah, parking, um, parking it just says you, you refer to what's set up, again, because things aren't quite as centralized. Parking says you, you look at what's going on in the central business district. So in the central business district, sorry, taking me one. One moment to brush up. So it talks about screening. Um, talks about no on-site parking spaces being in the front yard, and then no on-site parking spaces. This won't apply really in the central in Rio, um, but those spaces not being located within 15 feet of Sheridan Road. Essentially, it's a, it's a prohibition on front yard parking. Okay. So it really is a structure we're talking about. It's, an, it's equal in both 
Rio and L1, L2, that it has to be 100 feet. As far as for structures, structure. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so now we're approving the um, height and parking for? Just those bare minimum changes, yeah. Or at least that's, that, that is the motion you have on the floor. Second. Any uh, further discussion? All right, I want to just want to make sure that everybody's fully aware of what we'll be voting on. Right. All right. Could we have a roll call, please? Certainly. Once again, uh, all random. Member Badger. Aye. Member Murray. Aye. Member Burns. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Russell. Aye. Chair Peters. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Oh, agenda item number nine, PCZBA work planning overview. Yeah, we have pretty much um, have had the discussion at this point. Um, again, just thinking of the next few months, what we're trying to get accomplished. And if there's anything out there that we need to worry about that we haven't talked about, now would be the time. Otherwise, I think you know, our priorities will be um, getting our Rio um, discussion set, and then I'm, I'm hoping we'll see how far we get, but try to bring you as, as far ahead as we can get on a draft of the comprehensive plan um, before the close of the year. How many sections that is, I'm, I'm not quite sure yet, but we've been, we've still been laying some of the groundwork, and um, I think hopefully with the holidays we have a chance to really sprint at it. All right, staff report. I have no further report, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Commissioner's report. I would just like to congratulate Member Murray, because unless I'm mistaken, he's the first village resident to participate internationally in a uh, <laughs> commissioner board meeting in Lake Bluff. And we need to get that written down in the Lake Bluff history books. As times change, it'll probably happen more often. But he could be the first. And the <laughs> Well done. That, we have to find out where, where is he. A, a distinction at 3 a.m. that I will I say receive it's pretty early in the morning. Where is <laughs> He's he? in London. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And Mr. Murray, you can't see it, but Sam Badger is visibly astounded. I am I'm shocked. And <laughs> <laughs> my suspicions have been confirmed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a tremendous clarity, Jim, as far as the uh, communication. So that was, that was great. Yeah, thank no, you. I, I would just observe that on this end, uh, it actually works quite well. So uh, with the exception of jet lag, no one should be afraid. <laughs> All right, so we have a motion to adjourn, I guess. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. Mm. Voice vote. Aye. 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 Adjourned. Just Good night, Jim. Good night. Right Good night, all. <laughs> on Wednesday. Oh, they haven't played out. But I, it's insane.